Our speaker tonight is Michael Gerson, a nationally syndicated columnist for the Washington Post. He's the author of Heroic Conservatism and co-author of City of Man, Religion and Politics in a New Era. He's a regular guest on PBS NewsHour and Face the Nation. He serves as, as senior advisor at ONE, a bipartisan organization dedicated to the fight against extreme poverty and preventable diseases. And he was a top aide to President George W. Bush as assistant to the president for policy and strategic planning. He's also a former senior fellow at the Council on Foreign Relations. So please join me in welcoming Mike Gerson. Thank you so much. Good evening. It's really a um, pleasure to come from Washington, D.C. I came in today to San Francisco to be here this evening. And I'm glad to be at the JCCSF, and thank you for the invitation. Um, this is a week for big events. The Super Bowl, Jay Leno's last show tonight. I don't know if you're going to be watching. The Olympics. It's a little hard to compete with all this, especially when you're talking about the future of the Republican Party. Um, I, I guess, and I know at least why I'm here. As you know, the mayor of Sochi made the incredible claim that there are no gay people in his city. I, I came 3,000 miles to see if there are any actual Republicans in San Francisco, <laughs> and I just met some right here. So um, I stand corrected. Um, I know that uh, some of the earliest events of the Olympics actually uh, are taking place today, um, and you could probably be watching them if you wanted to. There's likely to be some drama and cultural tension. I'm not sure if you saw, but uh, the uniform of the German team features rainbow colors as a kind of subtle protest against Russian anti-gay laws. Um, it tells you a lot about Russia today that the Germans have to tell you to stop discriminating. <laughs> um, when I, I told my uh, Democratic friends, and I have many, that I was coming to California to talk about the future of the Republican Party, they uniformly responded, we hope that California is the future of the GOP, meaning no future at all. Um, and uh, not since 2006 has a Republican won statewide election. Um, the GOP uh, share of the um, uh, registered voters is now below 30%. Um, last Republican governor is uh, playing ping pong in a Super Bowl ad selling Bud Light, um, which I admit if you're a Republican in California contemplating the future of the GOP, you might need to start with a six pack. Um, but I will argue tonight, however, that America benefits from two healthy parties contending seriously about the nature of the common good. But before I get started, let me tell you a little bit about myself. Um, Speechwriters are supposed to be anonymous, and at this task I've succeeded beyond my wildest dreams. Um, in the spring of 1999, I was a senior editor at US News and World Report covering politics when I got a call from then Governor George W. Bush of Texas, who wanted to meet me at the JW Marriott Hotel in Washington. First thing he said to me was, this isn't an interview. I've read your stuff. I want you to write my announcement speech, my convention speech, and my inaugural address. And I want you to move to Austin immediately. At that point, he was not even a declared candidate, but his confidence was infectious, and so I loaded up my family and I, and into the car and went. Uh, from the start, we were a little bit of an odd couple. He's outgoing, athletic, likable, and I'm actually none of those things. Um, he has a uh, penchant for locker room humor that makes me uncomfortable. Um, I remember after one policy session at the governor's mansion in Austin, everyone had gone but me, and the governor had some time before his next appointment. He asked me, do you want to hang out a little while? With a rudeness that now seems crazed, I replied, not really, <laughs> which is not the way to treat the future president of the United States. But I came to respect Bush as a politician and a person. He is casual and funny and authentic, authentic and kind and loyal to the people around him. He can occasionally be sharp-tongued. Every year on the day of the State of the Union address, the president sits down with all the network anchors for a time of question and answer. 
At one of these sessions, the late Peter Jennings asked him, what does it feel like to go before the nation and read someone else's words? The president immediately replied, you do it every night. <laughs> the uh, pace of those years, including 9-11 and the Afghan campaign in Iraq and Katrina, was at times exhausting. It has a cost to your health. In December of 2004, while working on the president's second inaugural address, I had a heart attack. The president's doctor had me checked into the hospital under an assumed name to hide from all the press calls, adding insult to incapacity, there wasn't a single call. Um, <laughs> and uh, it has a cost to your family. During the heat of the presidential election of 2004, my little boy Nicholas, who was then six years old, announced to me in the car that he wanted John Kerry for president. <laughs> when I asked him why, he said, so you can be home on weekends. My nine-year-old was a little more practical than said, but how would we eat? <laughs> I told him, I think I can get a job, I might go to a think tank, and he asked, of course, what is a think tank? So I told him, well, it's people who read and speak and have meetings and things. And Bucky, and this is true, said, you mean they don't do anything? <laughs> After the uh, 2004 election, my job at the White House changed. I became a policy advisor focused on global health and development and the prevention of genocide, areas where my interests had been leading me for many years. And I saw something very hopeful. In one of the bitterest times of partisanship in modern history, I also found a number of issues where members of both parties and people of every ideology have come together. As part of my job at the White House, I worked with conservative and liberal groups to fight global AIDS and to confront malaria and to oppose global sex trafficking and to confront the crisis in Darfur. And I've seen some odd alliances grow. I've gotten to know Bono of the rock band U2 pretty well over the years. Several years ago, he invited me to the first rock concert I had ever attended, and it was loud. Um, soon afterwards, my wife and I had dinner with Bono, who is a very idealistic and principled man. After dinner, my wife told me, you may be idealistic and principled, but it would also be nice if you were rich and cool. <laughs> now I'm a columnist for the Washington Post, living under the tyranny of two deadlines a week. I often fill in for my friend David Brooks on the news hour when he's out of town. If David is off, there's a PBS union rule that requires the presence of a nerdy moderate on the program. That's me. I'm a regular on Face the Nation and even do some commenting on MSNBC. My topic this evening is the state of American politics and the Republican future. And this is an odd, disturbing moment in our political life. I would summarize it this way. The seesaw is broken. Often in political history, when one ideological side is down, the other rises. In this case, President Obama is down in the polls, down in personal regard and trust. Nearly 70% of Americans believe America has gotten worse or stayed stagnant during the Obama era. Recently, when Americans were asked what words best describe the State of the Union, the top three answers were divided, troubled, and deteriorating. But at the same time, only 24% of Americans have a positive view of the GOP. Pathetic. In the wake of the government shutdown, the GOP recorded the lowest favorable rating of either party since Gallup began asking the question decades ago. Americans are not happy with the president, but they do not regard the party of Ted Cruz as a viable alternative. Both sides are down. The seesaw is broken. There's a deep disenchantment with politics today, directed at both parties, most politicians, and many political institutions. Only about 19% of Americans say they trust the federal government to do what is right. Also some of the lowest numbers in polling history. This is bad news for modern liberalism, which requires a modicum of trust in government to operate. 
Does anyone think the failed launch of Obamacare has increased the chances of passage of universal preschool education or the further regulation of greenhouse gases? But my focus this evening is on the Republican Party. So let me step back a bit and consider the last election and Mitt Romney's loss, which previewed so many of the Republican problems today. It is easy to blame candidates for losses, and personality does matter in politics. In 1996, for example, Newt Gingrich had a 16% approval rating in the polls. At one event, he turned to Bob Dole and asked, Bob, why is it that people take such an instant dislike to me? Dole replied, Newt, because it saves them time. <laughs> At least that is the way that Bob Dole tells it, who I worked for during his presidential run. He also has a sharp tongue. I remember him saying that Al Gore was so stiff, his Secret Service code name was Al Gore. I don't uh, think Mitt Romney was particularly unlikable. Quite the contrary, particularly if you watch the new documentary, Mitt. But it was impossible to deny he is a bit of a throwback, a square. He told corny jokes. His family was aggressively nuclear. He opposed the use of all caffeine, tobacco, and alcohol. When Romney's wife, Anne, was asked in an interview to dish some dirt on her husband, she admitted that Mitt likes to drink caffeine-free Diet Coke, or as it is known in the Mormon community, a dangerous gateway drug. <laughs> and Mitt Romney came from a certain economic class. He was proof that even the millionaire son of a millionaire can beat the odds and run for president of the United States. I'm an economic conservative, but stepping back a bit, the Romney choice was amazing. Less than four years after the fall of Lehman, the GOP standard bearer was a venture capitalist who opposed the auto bailout, a capitalist caricature. All that said, the Republican challenge runs a lot deeper than a single candidate. With your patience, let me share a few numbers. The Democratic nominee has won four of the last six elections, national elections, averaging 327 electoral votes to, two to 210 for the GOP nominee. Over the last 20 years, Democrats have carried the popular vote five out of six times. They've exceeded 330 electoral votes on four occasions, while the GOP did not exceed 300 electoral votes even once. Compare this to the previous 20-year span. From 1968 to 1988, Republican nominees won five out of six elections. They averaged 417 electoral votes versus 113 for the Democratic nominee. During those six elections, the GOP topped 500 electoral votes once, 400 electoral votes twice, and 300 once. Democrats experienced landslide losses in which they carried 13, 17, and 49 electoral votes. This reversal of fortunes is dramatic and requires some explanation. The first reason is simple demographics. In 1976, about 89% of voters were white. In 2012, it was 72%. That is nearly a 2% decline in the most Republican portion of the electorate during every presidential election, drip, drip, drip. Consider this, if Romney had run with the same demographic composition of the country as it was in 1992, he won, would have won in a landslide. If he had run in the electorate of the year 2000, not too long ago, he would be president of the United States today. In 2012, he gained the largest percentage of the white vote of any Republican since 1988, but it wasn't nearly enough. Put bluntly, Republicans have a winning message for an electorate that no longer exists. Republicans have made this mistake before at the state level, including here in California. In 1994, Republican Governor Pete Wilson of California supported Proposition 187, which would have denied health care and education to undocumented immigrants and their children. 
You'll remember he ran commercials with the charming tagline, they keep coming. I remember one story from that time told by a successful Latino lawyer from here in California. His mother was 80 years old and decided she wanted to become an American citizen. After the difficult multi-year process, she took the oath with her son at her side. Afterwards, he asked her, why did you go to all that trouble? She replied, because I want to be a citizen of the country that was so good to you. And second, because I want to vote against Pete Wilson before I die. <laughs> Republicans are reaching that point with many Latinos. Mitt Romney talked of self-deportation for 11 million people, which would have been one of the largest mass migrations in human history. Herman Cain described his vision for a wall at the border, quote, it's going to be 20 feet high, he said. It's going to have barbed wire at the top. It's going to be electrified, and there's going to be a sign on the other side saying, it will kill you, warning. And then Cain helpfully added this is, that the sign would be written in English and Spanish. But some things conservatives apparently don't want in English and Spanish. We just saw some conservatives react badly to the Coca-Cola Super Bowl ad, um, which featured America and the Beautiful, sung in seven languages. Their immediate reaction was to be offended by too much multiculturalism and to demand American songs in English. Well, it's worth saying that e pluribus unum is not in English either. <laughs> and it's powerful, I believe, to hear American ideals of brotherhood, reverence, and sacrifice sung in other tongues, precisely because they have a universal appeal. After decades of involvement in public life, here is my proposal for the most basic truth of politics. Human beings know if they are welcome at a party or not. They know if their voice is wanted in the national chorus. My old boss, uh, uh, Jack Kemp, a great Republican, used to say, people don't care what you know until they know that you care. Republicans must prove that they care, offering a genuine welcome to immigrants and minorities to their party. Let me give you one more figure. About one in four American students entering kindergarten today come from a Latino background. A political party that consistently wins 27% of the Latino vote, as Mitt Romney did, will eventually cease to be a national party. A second explanation is economic. Republicans have an economic message on low taxes and economic growth that has changed little from 1980. Ronald Reagan was a great man. Today, in fact, is his birthday and he deserves all the honor that can be given. But we are now as far from Reagan as Reagan was from Harry Truman. And our economic challenges have changed quite a bit. Even as Americans have grown dramatically more productive, technology has replaced jobs, and globalization has put downward pressure on wages in America. So people work harder for stagnant incomes in an economy with fewer job opportunities. The collapse of working class families, the flight of blue collar jobs, the, dec the decay of working class neighborhoods, the failure of urban schools have combined to cause a crash in mobility and opportunity for millions of Americans in America today. Here is a fact that shocked me. At the worst of the Great Recession that we just went through, the unemployment rate for a four-year college graduate was 4.5%. For those with only a high school diploma, unemployment was 24%. These are two different universes of opportunity. Tax cuts alone don't solve that kind of problem. It's no longer enough to make capitalism more efficient. We must somehow make it work for everyone. But Republicans have little to say on education and skills and family and the health of communities. I'll avoid the temptation of preaching on this, but there are other conservative traditions than free market libertarianism. 
There are the great traditions of Hamilton and Lincoln and Teddy Roosevelt who built infrastructure and encouraged education and built human capital, preparing people to rise in a free economy. And Republicans need more of that today. A third explanation for Republican decline is cultural. There is a major generational shift in morality going on in America. Younger Americans are twice as secular as the baby boob generation. About 30 to 35 percent call themselves re religiously unaffiliated, an unprecedented level in American history. Changes in norms have been swift. In 2006, 34% of young people described premarital sex as, quote, never wrong. In 2011, it was 44%. Now, if history is any guide, some attitudes will grow more conservative over time. A future father with his own 14-year-old daughter will have a harder time thinking premarital sex is never wrong. But the baseline of social liberalism is starting higher than in previous generations with major political consequences as this cohort works its way through the decades. Republicans will need to maintain their base in the pew while appealing to the young, a task they have not even begun to figure out. It's an interesting figure I just saw today demonstrating this tremendous divide. Mitt Romney won the 19 most religious states in America. Barack Obama won the 14 least religions ones. America is increasingly divided by religiosity, not just politics. Now, America is still far from becoming Sweden, but the tone of Michelle Bachman or Rick Santorum on social issues is not going to be an option in the future. In the course of the recent election, Rick Santorum said, one of the things I will talk about that no president has ever talked about before is, I think, the dangers of contraception in this country. And there's a reason no president has ever talked about it before. <laughs> because contraception is as American as, well, apple pie flavored condoms, which actually do exist. Um, <laughs> don't ask me how I know this. Um, and, and Mike Huckabee, amazingly, um, has recently uh, broached this topic again. Voters don't take risks on things they value most. There's a great story from the 1964 campaign when Barry Goldwater asked for the vote of an elderly woman. She told him, I'll never vote for you. You want to take away my TV. Goldwater patiently explained that he wanted to eliminate the TVA, the Tennessee Valley Authority, <laughs> not the TV. To which the woman responded, well, I'm not going to take any chances. <laughs> Americans aren't going to take any chances on their contraception. And all of these trends, alienating rising groups, an irrelevant economic message, and an off-putting cultural signals, have found their culmination in the Tea Party movement. The main leader, of course, is Senator Ted Cruz, who was born in Canada. America has many enemies in the world, Iran, Syria, North Korea, but it took a Canadian to shut down the US government. It was a moment that summarized the worst image of the GOP, an excess of rage and an absence of strategy. And it demonstrated the GOP problem. Republicans who believe that their only political task is to reflect, to exactly mirror public distrust of government have drawn the wrong lesson. Those who ride purely negative populism to power will merely become newer objects of public disdain. Americans do not want public officials who share their contempt for government. They want public officials who no longer justify their contempt for government. The alternative to government failure and overreach is not to do nothing it is to offer a superior governing vision. It's an open question. Can Republicans do what it takes to recover, or do they need another presidential loss or two to put them in the right frame of mind? A political party is either looking for converts or it is looking for heretics. For the last few elections, conservatives have been more interested in weeding out ideological heretics, and they have suffered for it. They need to begin making some converts. 
It won't be enough for Republicans to simply say the same things they've, they've always said in Spanish. The changes will need to be substantive. But parties have done it before. Bill Clinton had to escape the shadows of McGovern and Mondale in order to win the presidency. He ran and governed as a new Democrat. Tony Blair had an even worse challenge, a Labor Party officially committed in Clause 4 to the, quote, common ownership of the means of production. He had to launch new labor in order to regain power. David Cameron had to remake the party of John Major. It takes a talented, creative leader, but there are plenty of precedents. And I think we are seeing stirrings of change in today's GOP. The height of Tea Party populism is probably behind us. Among all Americans, negative views of the Tea Party have more than doubled since 2010, with smaller but similar uh, results coming among Republicans. The shutdown, the government shutdown, was a psychological turning point for many Republican leaders that I talked to, who have largely turned away from such suicidal tactics. Party officials, major GOP donors, and the Chamber of Commerce are actively intervening in Republican primaries to help defeat unelectable Tea Party candidates. And we've seen some rising leaders, people like Paul Ryan and Marco Rubio and Eric Cantor, putting forward a more positive agenda than the Tea Party fantasy of bulldozing much of the modern state. They're setting out alternatives to fight poverty and to provide health care. This is a party slowly feeling its way back to the real world, but preparing for a chaotic 2016 presidential primary where there is no clear or obvious choice. But I think Republican leaders seem to realize that recovery depends on a few things. A tone that doesn't frighten the country, a genuine interest in those struggling in our economy, and an actual governing agenda that matches the challenges of our moment. But all this political up and down masks a deeper problem. Presidents of both parties are increasingly faced with the same challenge, the growth of political polarization that makes progress on any issue more difficult. And this trend is threatening the future and standing of America in some very practical ways. To show the extent of this trend requires some more figures. The two political parties in America have grown more politically homogeneous. Political scientists call this ideological sorting. There used to be conservative Southern Democrats and liberal Northern Republicans, both of which are now a rare breed. In the 111th Congress, for the first time in a long time, the voting record of every single Democratic senator was to the left of the most liberal Republican. And every single Republican was to the right of the most conservative Democrat. In other words, the voting patterns of the two parties did not overlap at all. National Journal just published its newest study on polarization today. It found this Congress, quote, more polarized than any Congress since National Journal began calculating its ratings in 1982. Public itself has grown more partisan and divided over the years. In 1984, about 10% of Americans placed themselves on either the extreme left or the extreme right of the ideological spectrum. By 2004, that figure was 23%. I think that the partisan media has played an important role in this trend. Many media outlets get viewers and hits by confirming existing views and feeding partisan outrage. These are not primarily sources of information, but sources of ammunition. This is the reason I'm a lonely conservative fan of mainstream institutions such as the Washington Post where I work and the News Hour, which, is at, which at least attempt to apply journalistic standards of fact-checking and fairness. Over the last few decades, We've seen people even sort themselves geographically, choosing to live in places where others think like they do. In 1976, only about a quarter of Americans lived in counties where presidential candidates won by landslide margins, one way or the other. By 2004, it was nearly half of Americans living in landslide counties. In 1972, New York film critic Pauline Kael famously said, I can't believe Nixon won. I don't know anyone who voted for him. 
What was true in insular Manhattan is now true in much of the country. People don't just inhabit different parties, but different planets. There's less contact, less sympathy, less civility than there used to be. It is the nature of polarization that each side believes the other is to blame. In this case, both are right. One poll last year found that 24% of Republicans agreed, and this is true, that Barack Obama, quote, may be the Antichrist. This is what passes for an undecided Republican voter these days. They're not quite sure if Obama is the Antichrist or not. But I also don't want to leave President Obama entirely out of this criticism. The president has many virtues as a leader, including objective decision-making, deliberation. He also has a tendency to view his opponents as rubes and knaves. Few presidents have more consistently or aggressively questioned the motives of their political rivals. None, to my knowledge, used an inaugural address the way he used his second to accuse his opponents of, quote, mistaking absolutism for principle and treating, quote, name-calling as measured debate and wanting the twilight years of seniors, quote, spent in poverty and ensuring the parents of disabled children have, quote, no place to turn and reserving freedom, quote, for the lucky. I worked on two inaugural addresses and read them all in preparation, a difficult task, but for the most part, they are civic rituals of unity. Obama tried to delegitimize his political opponents. I think future presidential scholars will view that document as a culmination of polarization. Why should we fight this kind of division? It's easier just to join in and even enjoyable. H.L. Mencken once said, every normal man must be tempted at times to spit on his hands, hoist the black flag, and begin to slit throats. I've been tempted myself. We often have a sneaking admira admiration for political ruthlessness. Robert F. Kennedy once joked about his reputation, I am not ruthless, and if I find the man who is calling me ruthless, I shall destroy him. But there are genuine costs of contempt in politics. Extreme polarization is the product of democracy that undermines democracy. It increases incivility and magnifies distrust in government. It causes some to abandon civic engagement in disgust and others to join angry in ideological insurrections. In Congress, it adds to the obstructive power of cohesive partisan blocs and makes bargaining and compromise in the public interest more difficult. And this is a problem because there are large issues at stake in America. We face a fiscal crisis resulting largely from an aging society, long-term health cost inflation, and the cost of entitlements. The Congressional Budget Office Outlook document this week paints a grim picture. This year and next, deficits are declining. But as soon as 2016, America is back on a bad track, and the long-term numbers are unchanged from recent years. CBO put it this way just this week. I just want to read this section. Over the next decade, debt held by the public will be significantly greater relative to GDP than at any time since just after World War II. With debt so large, federal spending on interest payments will increase substantially as interest rates rise to more typical levels. Moreover, because federal borrowing generally reduces national savings and capital stock, and wages will be smaller than if debt were lower. In addition, lawmakers would have less flexibility than they, they otherwise would to use tax and spending policies to respond to unanticipated challenges. Finally, such a large debt poses a great risk of precipitating a fiscal crisis during which investors would lose so much confidence in the government's ability to manage its budget that the government would be unable to borrow at affordable rates." End quote. This is the type of serious warning we are consistently getting. Too many Democrats, in my view, think about this issue the same way some Republicans think about global warming. They don't exactly deny there's a problem. They just don't have a solution that easily fits the rest of their ideology. So they end up pretending the problem isn't there. On top of this, we face a social problem, as I mentioned, of collapsing human capital among the poor, 
leading to stalled economic mobility. This really concerns the definition of our country. Americans are generally comfortable with inequality in a free economy as long as economic advancement is a realistic goal. But in the absence of economic mobility, inequality is just a caste system in which birth is destiny. And both Republicans and Democrats should be offended by the growth of a class-based society. Our nation is going to need to undertake a series of complex, controversial reforms of our entitlement system, our tax code, our regulatory system, our education system. In a divided government, both parties will need to act together and share risk to join hands and jump off some cliffs together. This will be hard enough without the cultivation of ideological rigidity. Our political system was designed for disagreement, but it is undermined by mutual contempt. Our constitutional order assumes contending factions. It is weakened by warring tribes. It is a problem that feeds on itself. Every outrage becomes an excuse for the next escalation. Both sides feel victimized, which becomes a justification to cross limits and boundaries. Neither side feels responsible for the problem, while both contribute to it. Meanwhile, we threaten to become a nation with the responsibilities of a superpower and the politics of a banana republic. It's easy to get depressed about all this, particularly when you write about it every day. But over the years, I have found something I didn't really expect. The closer you get to American politics, the less cynical I've become. The more you learn about American history, the less pessimistic you are about the present. At least that's been my experience. I've spent time on the Senate floor and in the Oval Office. I've seen public officials suddenly realize the gravity of their profession, the scale of their historical task, and become as large as the office they hold. One of my favorite Oval Office stories concerns Claire Booth Luce, the journalist, playwright, ambassador, and Republican congresswoman. She was sitting in the Oval Office with President John F. Kennedy, discussing the need to stand up to the Soviet Union. JFK got a call and had to interrupt the conversation. It was an important call, Claire, he said. I just got my milk subsidy bill through. To which Luce said, Mr. President, every great man gets a single sentence in the history books. <laughs> of one man it was said he went in search of an old world and found a new world. Of another it was said he assembled a motley army and defeated the greatest power in the world and gave birth to the greatest nation in the world. And of another it was said that he had to travel in the dark of night to Washington to his inauguration in order to assure America would not be half uh, free and half slave. Of none of those men was it said that he got his milk subsidy bill through. <laughs> Kennedy faced this kind of test in the Cuban Missile Crisis with the fate of the world in the balance and passed it with strength and restraint. People dismissed the do-nothing Congress of the Truman era, but forget it actually passed the Marshall Plan. I was in the White House during a period of intense, bitter polarization, but it was also a time when a bipartisan majority passed PEPFAR, the President's Emergency Plan for AIDS Relief, which helped save millions of lives and earned our country tremendous goodwill around the world. And I'll tell you one more story from this period. During the Oval Office meeting when PEPFAR was discussed, there were a lot of arguments back and forth. The plan was expensive, the infrastructure to implement it was weak. Nothing like the distribution of AIDS drugs on this scale had ever been attempted before in history. But at one decisive moment in that meeting, the National Security Advisor, Condi Rice, spoke up. She talked about how her mother had been diagnosed with cancer when Condi was a teenager but went on treatment and lived until Condi became an adult. I remember, I remember Condi saying in that Oval Office meeting, you bet those mirrors, years meant something to me, and they would mean something to every African child whose mother lives to take care of them. And with more than five million people now living on AIDS treatments across Africa, she was right. Leaders can rise to their moment and change the direction of events. It is one reason that pessimism about, about America is seldom justified. America has a long history of declinism, which seemed fully justified, say, in the War of 1812, or in the middle of the Civil War, or, or during the Great Depression. 
In the 1950s, for example, the CIA predicted that the Soviet economy would be three times larger than America's by the year 2000. In 1960, Barry Goldwater said, quote, it is clear we are losing the Cold War. Vietnam seemed a sign of fatal decline. In 1987, the scholar Paul Kennedy wrote The Rise and Fall of the Great Powers, asserting that America was overstretched and growing weaker not long before America emerged as an unrivaled global leader. Now people like me write about political gridlock and polarization and fiscal crisis and credit downgrades and the rise of China and India, and these are serious things. But Charles Dickens, a keen observer of America, noted and dismissed this tendency long ago. He said that if Americans are to be believed, America, quote, always is depressed and always is stagnated and is always in an alarming crisis and never was otherwise. Dickens puts his response in one of his lesser novels, Mar uh, Martin Chuzzlewit, in which a character wonders how he would paint the American eagle. Quote, I should want to draw it like a bat for its short-sightedness, he said, like a rooster for its bragging, like a peacock for its vanity, like an ostrich for putting its head in the mud, and like a phoenix for its power of springing up from the ashes of its faults and soaring up anew. Nothing, of course, is faded or certain, but I would not bet against the ability of America to rise from the ashes of its faults and soar up anew. Thank you very much. Happy Question. to take some questions. Why do you suppose the Republicans still do okay at the state level? Is it just the homogeneity factor? I think you kind of have to uh, disaggregate here, and it's part of the problem. Okay? The way that the Republican Party wins in its stronghold of support in the South, often in uh, highly gerrymandered districts, where almost everyone looks and believes exactly like you do. And that's true, by the way, of a lot of Democratic districts and Republican districts. Um, the very method by which they win in these districts makes it harder for them to compete on the national level. And it crea it's creating a huge tension in Washington between the party of Congress, which has an entirely different political dynamic often. I talk with very good men, off the record, Republican members of the Senate and House, who um, have a constant fear of being primaried in Republican primaries by Tea Party challenges. And it has had a serious effect, say, on the immigration debate in our time. Um, and that, I think, is creating a dynamic that's very different than a Republican presidential candidate faces that has to appeal in a national electorate and, and win in, the, in this situation. I think um, immigration is where uh, that tension is most clear right now. And it was disturbing to me that um, the, the Senate, which approved comprehensive reform uh, last year, um, that the percentage of Republican uh, senators who supported that reform was actually lower than the percentage that voted for the Bush reform in 2007. And that really is a measure of the internal dynamics of the Republican Party on these issues. Um, so it often takes a presidential candidate to do this change. I mentioned Bill Clinton. Uh, you know, people discount it, but George W. Bush did this in the year 2000 with Compassion and Conservatism, trying to reposition his party on education and other issues. And it's possible that you could have someone come out of the Republican uh, primary process that does this. But I guess I would only say, without going too far, and we can deal with it a little more um, in other questions, um, that um, the, this process given a bunch of different dynamics about the way our campaign finance system re works, the way conservative media works, the growth of Tea Party institutions and, and donors, I think we're likely to see a very chaotic 2016 process, very much like we had in the last time around. And it's going to be interesting to see what comes out of it. So. 
Our next question over here on your right in the back. Um, hi. Um, sure. Barbara Bush recently came out and made a statement about her own son, Jeb Bush, being part of a political dynasty and maybe perhaps not being the person should run for president. And by inference, I think she was talking about the Clintons, too. Um, in, in light of your last response, are there any upcoming Republican women who could run for office. I don't want a 70-year-old in the White House anymore. I want some young people there. Um, Barack Obama was sort of a young person, too, with not that much real experience. Are there some rising stars in Republican or Democratic women or independent women that mm -hmm. might um, be able to be elected president in the next five to 10 years? Well, before I, I answer that, let me just tell you one Barbara Bush story, um, because I, she says exactly what she believes at any given moment, and you know this. Um, but I first met her at Kenny Bunkport when I was working on the first uh, convention speech, uh, George W. Bush's convention speech. And then Governor Bush introduced me to her and said, this is the guy that's writing the convention speech. And all she said to me is, then we'll know who to blame. <laughs> so <laughs> she really does speak her mind. Um, I wish I had a better answer here. I look at the Republican field right now, um, and uh, I don't see what you're, what, you know, what you're referring to, and it would be very helpful. Um, you know, there is a generational shift going on. Um, <laughs> someone from an entirely different perspective, like Marco Rubio, might be an interesting contrast that begins to reverse some of these expectations about the nature of the Republican Party. Um, but I really wish that I could uh, you know, give you um, some other name than Sarah Palin <laughs> um, as, a, uh, as a widely respected Republican woman um, in, in the context of a primary battle. Um, and. Um, uh, maybe there are other people in the audience who could, who could do that. that. That is a serious problem that I think the party has had over the years of candidate recruitment. And, um, and I think it's, you know, it's emerged in a lot of different ways. So. Next question on your left. Yeah, yeah what, ha what happened to the, why the demise of the moderate Republicans, finding me from the Northeast, Jacob Javits, Governor Rockefeller from New York, Senator Brooke, from uh, Massachusetts, et cetera. And is there any hope in a national level that, or hope that this type of branch of uh, moderate Republicans will uh, actually have some say in the party? Well, I alluded it, to it in my remarks. You know, political scientists call this sorting, and we've had the ideological sorting of the parties. We now have a more liberal party and a more conservative party. The Democratic Party remains, they call it, asymmetrical polarization. The Democratic Party remains more ideologically diverse than the Republican Party, which is more homogeneous. Okay? But both of them, over time, have become more ideologically homogeneous. Um, and some of that is really regional. You used to have um, conservative Democrats in the South who, you know, blue dog Democrats have gone the way of the dodo. I mean, they're the ones that have been most vulnerable and taken down in a series of wave elections. Um, and you've had the concentration of, of Republican representatives in the South, and this similar uh, dynamic has taken place in the Northeast. Um, it's the reason that before his current troubles that, you know, there was one reason that Chris Christie, um, gaining nearly 70% of the vote in his reelection in a, in a very blue state um, was gaining some traction, attention. Um, but, um, uh, but I think that, the, I mean, political scientists would tell you that's one of the big trends of our time, is that parties have become sorted ideologically and sorted uh, regionally. And there are still some parts of the country where that's not so true, and there are battleground states and other things. But the center of gravity of the parties has really become regional and ideological. Next question over here up front. Sure. 
Hi, thank you so much for your talk, very interesting. Sure. Mm -hmm. um, I have sort of a two-part question. I was uh, really interested in your referring to Jack Kemp about mm -hmm. you know, really welcoming uh, people to the Republican Party, specifically you mentioned immigrants and minorities. But I'm wondering beyond sort of the superficial welcoming, what sort of substantive changes do you see the Republican Party embracing in the next few years to welcome these groups? And second, in what ways does that apply or not to the gay community, specifically given the division mm -hmm. over gay marriage? Yeah. The, um, on the first question, I think that appeal, appealing to rising immigrant communities and white working class communities, which are both big Republican needs, because Mitt Romney, if you get into the numbers, underperformed with both of those communities. Okay? But it, some of the answers are similar. The, I think the the best thing Republicans could do is to have a social mobility agenda. Okay? Um, we have a pretty sterile economic discussion often with Republicans talking about freedom and small business. If you listen to the Republican convention the last time, you'd think every American were a small business owner instead of people who work and want to get ahead in life. Okay? Um, and you have Democrats that talk often about inequality. Um, there is a middle ground in American life that's mobility. That's preparing people to succeed in a free economy, giving them the tools and education and training and ability um, to uh, advance over time. One of the biggest challenges the American economy has is that American levels of social mobility, which is moving from the lower quintiles to the upper quintiles over a lifetime, are actually lower than Canada, lower than Scandinavia, lower than France. That's a very deep tension in the American ideal when we've come to the point where American social mobility is stalled for large groups of people. Um, I'm hoping that Republicans will have a message there, and you have to have more than a libertarian message on this. This is actually reaching out having a message on education and training and savings and asset building and all of those things that help bring people over time to advance from one quintile to another in economic mobility. Um, that strikes me as an open field for Republicans, as a really promising area where they could be, have an activist government, but not in building vast bureaucratic uh, you know, institutions, but in trying to empower individuals to be able to compete in a free market. Okay. Um, so I think that that's a, a uh, I think that's the area where they could, they could have a real difference and it would have a broad appeal in America. It would not be a narrow appeal. It could appeal to white working class, uh, which are, have had huge problems in, in America over the last two or three decades, and also appeal to rising minorities. You mentioned the gay community, and this, we're seeing some of the largest, most concentrated social change on any topic in modern history on this issue. And Republicans are gradually getting accustomed to this change. Um, and it's different than some other issues that you might think. Um, and I'm sure this is controversial in this room, but a couple of years ago, I did a column that for the very first time in the history of Gallup polling, this was two years ago, you had a majority of Americans call themselves pro-life. That had never happened before. At the same time, you had a majority of Americans that said they favored homosexual rights. Okay? Or actually, in this case, that said that there was nothing morally problematic about homosexual relations in the Gallup polling. Those two issues, you know, 20 years ago, Republicans would have expected that they'd move in the same direction. They've gone in different directions in America. Um, and so I think we're going to have a Republican Party that's uh, progressively much more open to, to the protection of basic rights, homosexual rights, on the international realm, but also in the domestic realm. Um, at the same time, the Republican Party probably remains a strongly pro-life party. Um, 
and given the constituencies within the party itself. So we're going to see change on some social issues, I think, reflected in the, in the party, and probably not so much change on some other issues, as given the, the way the party has, has, uh, is moving forward. So. Next question. Uh, I really like your, uh, your analogy to the broken seesaw. Right. And I was wondering whether you could comment on the idea that America is no longer governable. I mean, we are uh, three and 317 million people. We're represented by 535 people. Um, the founding fathers thought everybody would be in Cincinnati and go home after six years or two years or whatever time was necessary for them to do their job for the people. And now, you know, you have people who are the, in, the, in the Congress for 40 years, 35 years. So is it possible that given where we are, we need to rethink the social contract and the basis, you know, for living together and perhaps thinking about regions, which you so, you know, well described how, you know, people move to the region where they're comfortable. Maybe we should be regions, not states. We're the only democracy that is run the way we are with, federal, with federalism. Most of the other democracies are parliamentary. So is, there, is that something people are talking about? Well, I will tell you, one, one, of the reason that, one of the reasons I am a conservative, even though I think that the party needs to change significantly, is I think a lot of our federal institutions Social Security, Medicare, Medicaid, were designed in the middle of the last century or the early part of the last century at a time when they made perfect sense. And now we've had a massive economic revolution that has decentralized power where people want much more control over their own lives, but we have institutions that don't really match that. Okay? I think that someone's going to come to, you know, forward with effective reform agenda in a variety of these programs that keeps the safety net, but does it in ways that empower individuals more. So it's one of my criticisms of Obamacare, um, is that I do think this, this is not a takeover of, of health care, but it is a regulatory takeover of health care, and it does prove that some systems are so complicated that it's very hard to determine what the outcomes are going to be when you regulate. And we're going to see that over the next two years, where we're going to have unsustainable markets and, you know, for in these exchanges and, you know, serious problems. And it's because we haven't learned the basic lessons about decentralization. So I think part of the answer here is we're still going to have federal institutions, but we should have decentralized solutions to human needs that guarantee public goods, but do it in a way that empowers individuals. I think that that's a good thing. I actually think, though, that um, federalism, the way you describe it, um, is still fairly effective. Um, you know, we do have an effective decentralization of American power through the states in America. Um, and it is one of the kind of basic genius of the Constitution is that there are federal powers and, and state powers, and many of this is done through states. Um, I actually think that states probably deserve more control over things like Medicaid um, within the bounds of guaranteeing basic uh, protections for the vulnerable, um, but more ability to make choices um, about how those are implemented, and then a virtuous competition to see how these things can be better done. Um, so I, I, you know, maybe I, I, I guess I would disagree. I think that one of the, the great genius of the American founding um, is that um, we do have a significant degree of decentralization in our system um, that allows a variety of approaches to, to these kind of questions. Um, is America ungovernable? Um, I guess, uh, not to sound too libertarian because I'm not, um, but I do think 
that it's becoming increasingly difficult on any kind of major question to impose centralized national solutions in a variety of topics. Um, I think that's a recognition of fundamental economic changes and realities um, and social expectations. Um, and um, uh, you know, that doesn't mean we cease to be one country, but it does mean we're likely to see different forms than we're taking different forms of government than we saw in progressivism and the New Deal. So. Our next question up here. Yes, uh, two very brief comments and a question sure. for you. Sure. Um, I, I think I've had this fanciful thought, the woman was speaking of regionalism, I've had this fanciful thought that since this country is so polar that we could divide it into two countries and in one country, uh, if you don't mind my phrasing it this way, uh, in, or in one of the countries, they can have all the wars they want, they can have all the corporate capitalism they want, they can take away all the social programs they want, they can have English only, they can be opposed to contraceptives, and let them have that side of the country, maybe divide along the Mississippi or something, and then the other side of the country where people have what many of us might regard as a caring society, and certainly one that's anti-war. Um, the thing I'm really pessimistic about in, in this country, and I think I'm afraid that we're over the edge, is big money in politics. And mm -hmm. it scares me as much for the Democrats as it would for the Republicans. And NSA dragnet spying, mm -hmm. where I see repeatedly on TV that the so-called war on terrorism is as much a war on dissidents or at least intimidating dissidents, especially progressive dissidents. My question for you is, and maybe you've already answered it, but I'll try to come at it from a slightly different angle, and you may feel free to say you've pretty much answered it. Um, I wondered, especially because of the uh, Palin-McCain ticket, where we had this, uh, I think he was at least 72-year-old guy, and he, he wasn't a young 72-year-old like you get in California who ride uh, mm -hmm. their touring bikes. <laughs> Mm -hmm. across country, and, and this woman who scared a lot of people. Right. And at least on, on the vice presidential level, you know, she was somewhat reminiscent of Goldwater, where you have a ticket where people vote as much against as they do for. And I'm wondering, uh, you mentioned uh, maybe a certain lack of candidates, if I understood, why, just analytically, not that I'm a Republican, why there couldn't be like an Elizabeth Dole. I don't know if she's still in the running, but you know, I just mm -hmm. analytically, I wonder why the Republicans don't run a reasonable ticket. Because you pointed out that Chris Christie was seen as sort of like this reasonable Republicans that a lot right. of Democrats would vote no, for. No, 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 I, no, I understand. I, I would, yeah, no, no. I would only, uh, on, your, on your first point, um, I think we actually, tried dividing the country before and didn't really work out very well. <laughs> um, but, and it was interesting, by the way, that if you look at the run-up to the Civil War, um, you know, obviously the South wanted to be s separate, um, but there were abolitionists in the North who wanted the North to succeed, secede from the South because they thought that they were beyond belief or beyond redemption. Okay. Um, so, I, you know, I think there's something useful in having a single country, even in a very diverse uh, society. Um, you raise a really good question. I, I would only ha about the nature of the ticket, um, the Republican ticket, and, and how it positions itself. It's a little bit complex, because in, um, in the last two elections, uh, Republicans really didn't go insane and pick the most absurd of candidates. Mitt Romney was the moderate candidate comparatively in this race. John McCain is pretty moderate on a lot of issues. I mean, choosing Palin is, is a different matter, but McCain himself won a primary where the, almost everyone was to his right. Okay. So it's, it's complicated. I don't think they were necessarily strong candidates, but they were not extreme candidates. Okay. Um, my concern about this current process for the Republican Party relates exactly one point to what you were saying about the role of money in politics. And you know, as a Republican, we don't often talk this way, but we saw it in the last time that given our campaign finance system, it has created a circumstance with a disproportionate influence of eccentric billionaires in American politics. Okay. 
Um, in the Republican primaries, um, Newt Gingrich was supported by Sheldon Adelson, who was a you know, guy who made his money in gambling. Okay? And because of the way that you can spend money in our system, he didn't have to go and do grassroots organization. He didn't have to do small donor raising. Okay? He just had to have a billionaire support him. And he spent all that money running the nastiest negative ads you can possibly imagine about Mitt Romney, about the eventual Republican candidate, deeply hurting him in the, as the primary unfolded. Okay? It's a real challenge for Republicans because it's not going to change in this, this time around. Okay? Um, you know, the, money can have strange influences on politics. Um, and sometimes in America, it can exaggerate uh, ideological imbalances um, where, uh, I, you know, we could very well see a combination of three things that destabilizes the Republican primary process in this, this time around. I still think we're likely not to get the most extreme of candidates, but you could have a very unstable process for three reasons. One of them is the influence of uh, major donors in, in primaries, which is exaggerated influence. Another one is the growth of conservative media, particularly radio, which is increasingly apocalyptic. Okay. And that's true of even people that used to be seen as more mainstream. There's a shift that's gone on. And I don't quite know why that's true. Um, and, um, and I should never say three, because I'm trying to remember the last one. I get, like, um, oh, it's the, um, uh, the growth of uh, Tea Party, well-funded uh, Tea Party advocacy organizations like Heritage Action, okay, which is relatively new in American politics where uh, they are intervening to try to uh, you know, do independent expenditures and affect primaries in ways that are not, not very positive. And their, their main purpose is to, for themselves is to serve a particular brand of conservatism, not conserve the Republican Party. That's not their goal in all this. Um, and uh, those three forces could combine to create a lot of instability back and forth. We saw it last time around. Uh, with somewhat the elevation of someone like uh, Herman Cain in, in this process, um, who I, I do not regard as a serious candidate. I, I'll, I'll just end with one point. Um, in a primary process, the eventual candidate, when, when they have a strong opponent, can sometimes be strengthened. Okay? I think that Barack Obama was strengthened by an unbelievably close uh, primary battle with Hillary Clinton. I think he was strengthened as a candidate. The opposite happened with Mitt Romney. He was nearly defeated by a series of joke candidates. Okay? That's an entirely different dynamic. Um, and that, I think, the RNC is deeply concerned about this. This is why they've tried to limit the number of debates. We don't have hundreds of debates or whatever. Um, the reason that they've tried to uh, have more discipline in the ordering of the primary process um, is to try to prevent this kind of chaotic process that we saw uh, in 2012 and are likely to see more of. So. Next question. Oh, yes, thank you. Uh, mm -hmm. Thanks a lot for a very uh, informative talk. I sure. really appreciated it. Mm -hmm. So my question is, um, you talked about the deficit, and a large part of the gloomy pro projections of the future are really driven by healthcare costs, and sure. over the next two years, that topic's gonna to be really top of mind. Do you see any collaborative thinking appearing between the parties on the issue of healthcare? Because we've heard, you know, repeal, 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 mm -hmm. 47 votes or whatever, you know, obviously the shutdown, et cetera. Um, who's brave enough in both parties to try and actually stake out some common ground? Because if I recall, even the Obamacare framework was supposedly from a Heritage Foundation blueprint from the late mm. 90s, although it morphed in its own way. So I'm just curious if anyone's going to you know, take this as, as an opportunity. Well, I will tell you there's a huge debate among Republicans about whether re uh, the Republican Party should have an alternative to Obamacare or not, or just support repeal. I think just supporting repeal is a pretty irresponsible um, position. Uh, it's also not a politically viable one. I think, I, 
I don't believe, I think Obamacare has huge problems, as I've explained, but I do think that it's created certain expectations about pre-existing conditions and some other things that probably, from just a purely political perspective, but also a substantive one, are, are going to continue past Obamacare, no matter what, the, what, goes be, uh, what uh, you know, happens beyond it. Um, but you've had a large uh, argument between some who are more inclined towards a Tea Party uh, view that say, this isn't a valid federal role, why would we provide uh, any cover for our opponents by proposing an alternative? But you've actually seen, interestingly, the growth of a reaction against that, not among moderates, but among some non-Tea Party conservatives. So there was a recent um, plan introduced in the Senate by Tom Coburn, who's hardly a moderate, and Orrin Hatch, who's a little more in the, in the, in the middle. Um, that is a se the first, in my view, the, the very first serious Republican replacement alternative. And you can criticize it, but it's largely the creation of a national right to catastrophic health coverage, okay? And doing it in you know, ways that essentially empower individuals to purchase that coverage. Um, but it also has those elements about pre-existing conditions and, and uh, coverage for 26-year-olds, and I think, and some other of these, of these expectations. Um, so, a little bit of progress there. The House is now internally debating whether they're going to have their own alternative or not, member, key members of the House. And I know some of the people that are working on that, and I think it would be a responsible thing. Set it out. You know, this is what you'd rather do. It's less generous in these ways, but it creates less problems in this ways, and you know, kind of make, make that a, a, you know, a, a serious um, argument. The problem you raised, though, is really about Medicare, which is the main long-term deficit driver. Okay, and that is really no one's fault, except that people live a lot longer okay, in this system. Healthcare costs, even though they've moderated over the last couple of years, have increased dramatically over the decades and are likely to increase again moving, moving forward. Um, and we have relatively uh, you know, generous b benefit expectations and structure with just far fewer workers to fund this system. <laughs> That's not, you know, Republicans didn't cause that, Democrats didn't cause it, demographics have caused this. And it's a massive challenge, long-term challenge. Not short-term, because those numbers are driven by different factors, but 2030, 2040. Um, and if you delay uh, action, it gets harder over time. It's a, you know, it's a perfect uh, problem where it's easy to delay, but the results get worse. Um, and I don't see really anyone uh, talking in serious ways about, the, about this issue. Um, you know, this is an issue that even, uh, I remember, this is just a small indicator, but during the debate, uh, the Republican debates the last time around, Michelle Bachman, the ultimate Tea Party person, um, came out and attacked Paul Ryan for talking about Medicare reform, okay? Because she thought it was too politically explosive, okay? Um, and somebody's gonna have to talk about this, this set of issues. Um, and it is politically explosive, it's just difficult. Um, but I, I honestly, I haven't seen much um, in either party uh, a willingness to take, take that on. Our next question over here to your right. Were there process reasons that contributed to the polarization that we see today? And do you see any solutions process-wise that would make it easier to get things done despite living in a more polarized constituent base? Yeah, I, it's a really good question. And I'm not even sure I have my very strong kind of political scientific opinions on it. Um, the, um, I do think political scientists argue about, for example, the role of gerrymandering, that I, are, you know, about how closely tied to polarization it is. Um, but 
I just know from my experience, I talk to members who fear primaries, who fear uh, ideological primaries. Um, and, um, and I do think uh, creating districts in which the general election means nothing and the primary is the only election in, in, a, in, in a house district is a problem. Now, you know, that, that all has to do with state courts. There's, I'm not sure there's a national solution to the problem of gerrymandering. Some states have tried to deal with this. Court systems have tried to deal with it. Um, but I do think that drives some. Some people have talked about the re reform of congressional rules, and we've seen that now with the reform uh, as it relates to nominations in the, in the Senate. Um, whether, uh, you know, that's, that's positive or not. Um, the, um, uh, you know, the Senate defends its prerogatives uh, of the minority uh, heavily because it makes it different from the House. I mean, the, um, the um, you know, the Senate, one reason senators like to be in the Senate is because they have the power to block things. Um, and they give, up, they give up those powers hesitantly. Um, and there's a constitutional purpose for them. Um, so it's really hard for me to talk about, you know, a broad overhaul of congressional procedures. The House is not the problem. The majorities in the House can generally do what they want. But the Senate w is, is designed quite differently. And we've seen some eating around of the edges there. But it's... Um, um, so I, you know, I don't know. I, you know, I would... The other side here that I just want to be fair about the argument is that um, presidents do get to do some things when they're newly elected. Um, you know, George W. Bush, well, you know, uh, you know, Bill Clinton expanded EITC and did welfare reform and had a balanced budget even though uh, Newt Gingrich was in charge of the, of the, uh, of the House. Um, George W. Bush got No Child Left Behind and, and tax cuts and Medicare Part D. Um, and uh, for all the, the argument about it, uh, when Barack Obama was elected president, he got the, uh, you know, health, major health care reform and was able to do that. I guess the problem is those windows get gotten pretty narrow. Um, they're usually after elections or re-elections when a president can do this. Um, and, uh, and they often just depend, and I just don't know if there's an institutional answer to this, because they often depend on members who, um, who are not squishy moderates but want to get things done. Okay? So when we did No Child Left Behind and we attempted to do immigration reform, our main partner on the other side was Ted Kennedy in both of those. Uh, legislative battles. And Kennedy was a very strong liberal, but he wanted to achieve things. He was just not, uh, you know, there was something deep down that he wanted legislative results. And was willing, from within his own ideological tradition, to seek that very small boundary of the two circles overlapping on a couple of important issues. Um, and so I think leadership does really matter. I mean, legislative leadership, presidential leadership. Um, the problem is that, that you have trends in American politics right now where the very idea of compromise is a suspect um, virtue. I mean, it's, it's attacked as, a, as something negative. Um, I often make this directly to conservative audiences that call themselves constitutional conservatives. Um, but the Constitution was the result of compromise. <laughs> I mean, these were people that fundamentally disagreed on many topics. And you read the, the proceedings of the Constitutional Convention, it is constant compromise. Um, and people that were willing to do that from within the framework of strongly held views. Um, and so I think that some of it is that we need, uh, some of it is leadership, not just institutional. So. Thank you so much.